Well, it's a very great pleasure to be here again. Um, these walls have soaked up many wise and encouraging words, and it's great that the AHS is having its annual conference here. It's the right place for it to be. I'm going to talk, if I may, about uh, humanism, and the importance of doing so is very great, because in the debate between people who have a religious outlook and those who don't, the question most often asked by people who are religious is, well, what are you going to put in its place? What is going to be the foundation of our morality? Uh, how are people going to deal with the difficulties and tragedies of life? As if religion was the only resource for answers. And indeed, the assumption is sometimes made that it's the best resource for answers. But the fact is, of course, that there is a much richer, much deeper, indeed even more ancient than certainly the young religions of the world, like Christianity and Islam, uh, a much more uh, long-standing way of thinking about these things, which is vastly more uh, um, encouraging, uh, vastly more of a support to anybody who will accept the invitation to think along humanist lines. And the first thing to say about humanism is that it isn't a doctrine. It isn't a teaching. It isn't a list of do's and don'ts. Instead, it's an attitude. And the basic attitude of the humanist outlook is that in thinking about how we are to live lives that are flourishing, which are good to live, which are, uh, have at their heart very good relationships with our fellows in the human story, when we do this, when we begin that process of reflection, we have to do two things. We have to acquire a measure of self-understanding. You remember what's written over the entrance to the Delphic Oracle, know yourself, and that's an important uh, an uh, injunction it seems rather a cliche to us now. We live in the post-Freudian age of uh, uh, knowing ourselves as well as we possibly can. But uh, the idea that lies behind it is that when one has a sense of one's own talents and capacities for living a life that really does feel good to live, then one can make good and informed choices about the kinds of values that we could live by, and the sorts of goals that it would be worth us pursuing. And the all-important assumption that lies behind that in its turn is that there are as many kinds of good and worthwhile lives as there are people to live them. A view about the matter utterly different from a view that says there is one, a one-size-fits-all answer to how everybody should live, what the right answer is. And that, of course, is what all the great ideologies, and chief among them the religious ideologies, have always claimed. There's one right answer, one right way, and if you don't sign up for it, you can be in trouble. It doesn't matter whether you're Stalin or Torquemada, it doesn't matter whether your ideology is political or religious, they have the same tenor, and the tenor is, we know the answer, this is the truth, you must sign up for it. It always struck me as being a point of historical importance that people should notice the transition that occurred in the first thousand years of Christian history from the age of the uh, church fathers, the patristic writers in the fourth, third, fourth, fifth, sixth centuries of the common era, who wrote what was called apologetics, that is, accounts of justification for the faith, trying to persuade people, usually a skeptical uh, educated audience of people, why they should accept the doctrines and promises of the faith. Apologetics is an attempt to persuade people, to give them arguments, evidence, reasons why they should accept the teachings. By the time that the church was at the height of its power in the high Middle Ages, there was no longer any need for apologetics because it was by then a crime not to believe, and if you didn't, it wasn't a question of persuasion, you just got burned at the stake. And this is how things wag in this world of ours, that when uh, institutions get into positions of power, and the church did very early on. As you know, you were all reading about Constantine in the bath last night, so you remember that uh, he said, well, let Christianity be one among the accepted religions of the empire, and in less than a century, it was the only one. So, when we look at uh, uh, the... Uh, teachings of the great young religions of the world, particularly, as I say, Christianity and Islam, we see that the uh, premise on which they operate is that they have the answer. Their story is the right story, and all we have to do is to sign up for it. 
And in both those religions, and it's, a, it's again another striking contrast with the humanist tradition, is that they ask us not to think. Remember, the great sin in Christianity is pride. Stand on your own two feet and think for yourself. That's a big bad mistake. We pray, don't we? Not my will be done, but thy will be done. To die to yourself, to submit yourself to God. These are things that are regarded as virtues. Not to think, but to submit, to accept, to believe, and to obey. These are regarded as virtues. The very word Islam means submission. Submission of the will, submission of the intellect. You must just have faith. You must just believe. And the humanist tradition starts with the Socratic injunction to think for oneself, to take responsibility for the, for the choices that one makes in life and how one's to live it. And Socrates went around uh, talking to his fellow Athenians. His whole, the whole thrust of his uh, challenge to them was to think for themselves, to explore and investigate what they thought they meant by the sorts of concepts that shape their ethical lives. Courage, continence, the good, justice. What did they mean by it? Did they really understand it? And it's a very familiar theme in the Socratic dialogues that uh, Socrates' interlocutors would offer definitions of these ideas and Socrates would show them that they were mistaken. And very often the turning point in the dialogue would be when he had succeeded in showing his uh, um, debaters that they really didn't have the right idea or, or a correct idea. And then the process started of trying to explore what the right idea might be. And familiarly, of course, until we get to the middle and later period, Platonic dialogues, where Plato himself is telling us what to think. And as you know, he's the writer of the most beautiful Greek, but he was a really terrible old fascist. And so we didn't really want to, to go too far along the road with Plato himself. But what we've learned, from the, at least from the earlier dialogues, is that the kind of life that is worth living is the life considered, reflected upon, and chosen. That was Socrates' message. Socrates is often quoted as saying, the unconsidered life, the life not thought about and chosen, uh, is not worth living. Because one is living somebody else's idea of a good life. One is the football in somebody else's football match. The direction that one travels in is chosen by other people, or by conventions, or by society. So instead of really thinking things through, and really making decisions for oneself about one, how one is to live. One is just a, a pawn in another in a much larger game. And of course, the great religions of the world want that to be the case. They want acceptance and obedience. They want faith and submission. So there's a very, very sharp contrast between the humanistic outlook and the religious one. Religious doctrines very often are quite explicit about about how one should behave and what one should believe. Indeed, as churches and religious movements become more uh, um, complex and sophisticated and well-organized, they begin to tell us what to wear, what we can eat on certain days of the week, who to marry. I mean, if there is a deity, he has a very bureaucratic outlook on things, or she, for that matter. And this, is, this again, is a marked contrast with humanism, because as I say, humanism is an attitude. And the attitude in question is this, not just to think for oneself, to take responsibility for the choices that one makes, but also in viewing other people and one's relationship with other people, to do so on the basis of one's most sympathetic and generous attitude towards them. I sometimes put the point by saying our most generous and sympathetic attitude to human nature and the human condition but both those phrases, the phrase human nature and the phrase human condition, are of course uh, labels for something immense. History, philosophy, literature, uh, psychology, law, economics, um, the study of uh, political theories and institutions, are all of them in their different way contributions to the study of the human condition. What are the circumstances in which individual human lives are lived? How do communities work? By what institutions can um, those communities best operate themselves if there is to be a chance for individual members of them to flourish? Th these questions are exhaustively and sometimes exhaustingly examined and re-examined in all these great debates. And because of the sheer complexity of human society and human life, uh, there are uh, various approaches and theories about these matters and a considered choice of view that one takes about the human condition will very much depend upon the route that one navigates through these discussions.
Questions about human nature are even more complex again. There too, philosophy and literature and a number of other pursuits offer us contributions of insight into what it is to be a human being, what the underlying nature of humanity is. One of the earliest lessons that we learn when we think about these things is that human nature is tremendously diverse. It's a great plurality of kinds of uh, uh, experience in human nature. It takes a whole lifetime to start to understand ourselves, let alone other people. And perhaps one aspect of the really well-lived life is that it is a reflective life where we do try to make sense of ourselves and of others. But this is, as the French say, ouvrage de longue Hélène, a work of long breath, a work that could take up most of one's reflective moments during the course of a, of a thoughtful life. But the endeavor is worthwhile because if one is to relate to others um, well, if one is going to be a good neighbor to our fellows in the human story, then one has to be reflective about these matters. I love to quote George Bernard Shaw on this. You've, you've heard this before, no doubt, but you remember what he said about the golden rule. Everybody knows the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And Shaw said, under no circumstances should you do to others what you would like them to do to you, because they may not like it. And this is a very, very deep insight. Because if you think that how you behave to others should be what you like and what your tastes are, then you're making yourself the standard or the benchmark for the entire uh, human species. But really, to be a good friend to your fellows is to see them in their individuality, to recognize that they might be different from you, to adjust your behavior towards them, which is considerate and respectful of differences. Of course, all this is, lies under the government of what John Stuart Mill called the harm principle. You may remember, and you will remember, of course, because you were reading this in the bath last night, his great essay on liberty, where his real anxiety was not political tyranny, but the tyranny of social convention. The attitudes that your fellows in society might have about your individual way of living and the choices that you make. He was, uh, of course, living at the high point of the Victorian era where there was a massive and oppressive um, social tendency to get everybody to live in a very narrow and constrained kind of way. And he said the problem with that is that we need as many experiments in ways that a human life can be lived and can flourish as possible. We need to allow people to do things differently from one another if they choose. But the one constraint on them is what he called the harm principle, not to do harm to others, or at any rate, not to go out of your way deliberately to interfere with other people's chances of happy and fulfilling lives, or getting in the way of their choices unnecessarily. Certainly not, of course, of stealing and lying and cheating and, and uh, uh, doing harm to others in, in that more emphatic way. So the harm principle provides us with our constraint, and after that, none of us has a right to tell anybody else how to live or what to do, um, providing they're within those reasonable and responsible bounds. Now, I think that's a good point that Mill was making there, and it's a very humanistic point. It's a point about being generous and accepting of human diversity. You will all remember what uh, uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein said to his sister Hermione. You do remember this, don't you? Ludwig was a bit of an eccentric, and his sister Hermione said to him one day, oh, Ludwig, we can't make any sense of how you behave. You are so odd and difficult. And he said, you're like a person who looks out of a window and sees a man walking in the street in a very odd way. You don't know why he's walking like that, but it's because there's a tremendously strong gale blowing and he's struggling to make headway against it. This is a very, it's a, it's, it's a very speaking example because each one of us in the psychological landscapes of our lives have gales blowing from time to time. We sometimes do things, say things, feel things, behave in ways, that are puzzling to others. We sometimes see other people doing things and making choices that we don't approve of instinctively or like or understand. But if we remember Wittgenstein's great wind, then we uh, will perhaps be more sympathetic and a bit more tolerant about how it is with others. So humanism is not a doctrine. It's not a set of do's and don'ts. It is, as I say, an attitude. It's an invitation to approach the matter of living uh, in a way that is genuinely constructive. 
Where does humanism fit in the great debate that we're having at the moment? Because I think it's a debate which is not going to be shut down anytime soon. And I do think it's a debate that we, on the non-religious side of the argument, are going to win because we have history on our side. You may think that's an over-optimistic view, but uh, one can deduce all sorts of considerations. And I will in a minute, if you like. I'll talk about the great and um, uh, startling tendencies revealed by the Pew Center polling data in the United States of America about the shift from what is, after all, a highly religion-besotted country to increasing proportions of the population who are nuns, that's N-O-N-E -N -E in the plural, people who tick the nun box when they're asked by the, by the pollsters uh, whether they have a religious commitment. Something like 30 years or so ago, it was 8% of the US population that ticked the nun box. It's now up nearly 20%, if not indeed on 20%, but among under 35s, it's considerably higher. This means that one out of every five people that you meet as you walk down Fifth Avenue or through Central Park is going to be one of us, and the movement is increasing in that direction. It's increasing in that direction in a very interesting way. Uh, last year, at about this time, I went to the annual conference of the American Atheist Association, the AAA. They do have a drink, by the way. Um, and th this was held in Austin, Texas. Anybody there? Was anybody, you were there? It was great fun, wasn't it? Uh, one thing I was struck by um, was that the AAA have chosen a technique that has been so successful in the gay movement. And gays, at a certain point, back in the 60s and 70s, decided that they were going to be out and they were going to be proud about it. Out and proud, acknowledge the fact that you're gay, make it possible for other people who were gay but who were very nervous about coming out, to come out because they recognized they had friends, they had fellows in the movement, and society had to sit up and take notice. And the gay movement has changed the world uh, as a result, at least in the developed world. Still a huge amount to do in places like Iran where gays are hanged from um, uh, cranes in the public square in the most awful way. Well, at the AAA, the, uh, the movement now is to say, I'm atheist and I'm proud. I'm out about being an atheist and I'm proud. And you may think we are in our functionally secular Europe. Uh, this may seem a sort of obvious thing, but it's not so obvious. In fact, as I was doing a book tour with the God argument uh, around the states, um, I was hosted by, by, by people who were atheists or humanists or secularists, and they all, all of them, without exception, said, well, I can't really let on publicly that I'm an atheist because it would affect my business, or you know, I'm an insurance salesman, so you know, people who knew of my um, proclivities in this intellectual direction uh, wouldn't be too pleased about it. And I've had the experience of people coming up and saying, oh, you know, I've gone, in America this is, I've gone to church all my life, my family and friends and community, it's just a reflex thing, but I've discovered that I don't really believe any of it. And if I were able to you know, find friends and be part of a movement where I, I felt uh, um, comfortable, uh, it would be a tremendous relief. By the way, while I was in Austin, I said to my, um, the person who was responsible for my, the book tour part of being there, uh, I should point out to you, by the way, that Austin is said to be uh, to Texas what California is to the rest of the US, so it, it wasn't such a bad place to be from the point of view of being an atheist. But I did say to him, it would be tremendously good publicity for my book if somebody shot me. I mean, missed, of course, that would be a quite important part of the story. <laughs> but if somebody took a shot, which was, you know, not, not completely uh, off the cards in the southern states, that it would be great publicity. And he wasn't a very humorous individual, this, and he said in a rather doer tone of voice, he said, in Texas, assassination attempts are usually successful. <laughs> so I thought, better leave that suggestion to one side in that case. By the way, uh, on my uh, travels around the States uh, last year, I visited the Creation Museum in Oklahoma. I kid you not. My ghast was flabbered <laughs> the minute that I set foot across the threshold of that place. They have these uh, sort of electronic uh, um, tyrannosaur vegetarian Tyrannosaurus Rex <laughs> uh, playing with the children of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> I mean, the really dismaying thing about it was the troops and troops and troops of small school children being taken through and presented with all this as fact. That seems to me to be a human rights crime. 
And that is part of the reason for saying that it's important that we should have the, the humanist message at our fingertips. When you debate, as, as one sometimes does, maybe on the telly or the radio or in some public setting, with uh, people who are uh, invested in a religious commitment, so with bishops or mullahs or rabbis or whoever, you're not going to change their minds. Jonathan Swift said, there is no reasoning a person out of a position they weren't reasoned into. And this is the case with religion, because of course the vast majority of uh, uh, religious people are religious because of their early experience. They were indoctrinated as children. And uh, we, we all know that the usual trajectory, you know, when you're very small, for good evolutionary reasons, you're very credulous, you believe everything that the adults in your circle tell you. So you believe in Father Christmas, the Tooth Fairy, and God. Around about the age of 10 or 11, Tooth Fairy and Father Christmas fade out of the scene. But social reinforcement of religion is immense. So many church spires, so many synagogues and mosques and temples, uh, religious services on the radio and television, uh, men in dresses um, crowning the new monarch or marrying a prince to a new princess. So there's massive social reinforcement of religion in society. So children, having in their very early years been evolutionarily primed to be credulous, of course, when they become teenagers, no longer believe anything that the adults in their circle tell them. So that's good too. And if they've been taken to church every week as, as children, then when the courting years start in and the first you know, interest in the other sex, or the same sex for that matter, begins to flare up in an interesting way, religion is a nuisance. And so belief tends to fade. Until later on in life, when your parents die, you lose your job, you get ill, you can get depressed, you think to yourself, where is comfort to be found? Now, we all think that the past is a place where the grass was greener and the summers were longer, because of course, they were. When you're little, you don't pay taxes, people drive you around and get you ice creams. When you grow up, you find you have to do it all yourself. So the past was a much nicer place. And when you reflect on one of the aspects of how it was nicer, you remember going to church. So you might go along to the local church, and what happens? You meet nice people. They welcome you in, and you feel part of a community, and you will transfer that sense of belonging to the whatever religion it happens to be that the nice people themselves espouse. And that's what happens with reconversions in adulthood. The data suggests that they don't stick. This might last for a little while. Then people drift into what I call the feng shui tendency. This is crystals and having your fortune told and so on. Because after a bit, you know, all the stories of whatever religion you happen to, to have uh, rejoined uh, will, will begin to seem implausible again. And then finally, you'll drift out into a kind of acceptance. You've all seen that postcard. You know, the 19-year-old boy, know it all. The middle-aged man uh, say it all, you know, pontificating, and the old man saying, "Oh, bugger it all!" You know, so you do you do get to the uh, you do get to the point where none of these things matter any longer, and you're prepared just to accept the vicissitudes for what they are, and rather welcome the idea of death, uh, which is when you no longer have to pay taxes. But the whole point about debating people with a real investment in a religious outlook is that you're not going to change their minds. When one goes on to a program, as Andrew Copson does, as I do, as and perhaps a number of you do, to debate with religious people, you're not really talking to them because you're, you're not going to make a difference to them. But you might make a difference to people who are uncertain, people who are reflecting, people who are havering on the brink, or people who are just interested and want to know whether there is a good case on each side. Those are the people that one might be addressing, and it might, one might be helpful to them. And it will be especially helpful to them if they know that there is this extraordinarily rich view, the humanist tradition, starting from Socrates and Aristotle, running through the post-Aristotelian schools, the outlook of, of almost all uh, educated people probably secretly thought uh, in, in these ways, even if they were orthopractic, as they had to be, uh, had to go to church and sign up and say that they believed because otherwise the punishment was very severe. And then we know people like Erasmus in the Renaissance period and Hume in the Enlightenment, who looked back across the landscape of thought and saw people like Cicero and uh, uh, Seneca and others, and certainly the, the earlier philosophers, um, as being the ones who gave them their most inspiration.
Hume himself said, and you remember famously, Hume was an atheist visited by Boswell on his deathbed. I mean, Hume was on his deathbed. Boswell visited him to see how an atheist dies. Boswell himself was so superstitious, so anxious about death and what might follow it, that he went along out of the worst kind of curiosity, really, to see whether Hume was frightened and came away amazed at how tranquil he was and how prepared he was for death. But Hume it was who said, if only uh, I'd had Cicero put into my hands rather than the, the prayer book when I was a child, my whole experience of growing up would have been very different. And so indeed it would have done. This, by the way, is why uh, I did the, uh, uh, the good book, this, the humanist Bible. It's not a humanist version of the Bible, by the way. It's completely... It's premised on the idea that uh, if only the Bible makers who had taken lots of different texts and put them together, edited them and changed them and took out inconvenient occurrences of the word not and so on, you know, if only they had done that to uh, the secular literature of the world, the philosophers and historians, the poets, and put together a budget of the wonderful inspiration and insight and solace and understanding that the non-religious literature of the world has uh, um, in it, then a very different book, a different Biblos would have been the chief text of our history and maybe the world would be a very different place as a result. And when I thought this a long time ago, more than 30 years ago, when I was uh, studying the big contrast between the bases of ethical systems, it was when I saw you know, that religious moralities tend to be divine command moralities, uh, whereas um, non-religious moralities tend to be premised on the idea that it is our responsibility to think through our values and to choose them. And I thought to myself, well, if, only, if only they'd gone to the, those guys to make a Bible instead of to the preachers and the prophets and the madmen. And as soon as I thought that, of course, I next thought, somebody should do it. And then I thought, oh, damn. <laughs> uh, it did take about 30 years to do, and uh, th there is the result. And one thing about it uh, that I must say is that um, there's not one mention of the word God or goddess or faith or religion in it. Not one. There's no, I mean, I've written plenty of attacks on religion. I'm perfectly happy to have a go at, uh, at the bishops and the, the mullahs. But this, this book contains nothing in it that even a religious person would uh, find uh, intolerable. It starts, by the way, my book of Genesis, with the apple falling in Newton's garden, the beginning of science, which I thought was a much better place to start. Anyway, so that, the, 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 uh, the um, impulse behind it was to try to show that something which has been marginalized actually by the religions, because the religions are not interested in people thinking philosophically, they're not interested in them thinking at all. So that whole debate and that immense resource of insight and solace and inspiration which the non-religious literatures of the world offer us has been pushed aside in such a way that it's only philosophy undergraduates in universities who read some of that stuff because of the pressures of the curriculum. They don't even read that. Cicero and Seneca are not on philosophy curricula. And so that has been sort of lost to sight. It's the browser or the classicist or somebody who comes across very, very intelligent discussion of how we deal with life and make choices, how we're to think for ourselves, which is lost to sight to most of our culture, as I say. And I think there is something deliberate about it. But if one could remind people that it's there, if one could remind people that there is a different way of thinking, which is very, very powerful, and it provides us with a framework, a way of approaching life and other people and our own experience of life in a way that is so much, so much more fulfilling than the religious stories. I pointed out to people, and it's a great irritant to um, religious folk, but I'm afraid it's just a simple truth, that the doctrines and promises of any great religion of the world can be explained in less than half an hour. It takes years to understand physics, mathematics, and chemistry. It takes years to be a reflective, attentive, responsive reader of our fellows in the human story who have given um, the best of their intelligence to this great Socratic question, how should we live, what, people, what kind of people should we be, how should we think of, our, uh, of others in society. That is a work for a lifetime, the work of, of uh, um, being thoughtful and responsible for our choices. 
And it is so often happened, so often happened in history, that people who do think for themselves about these matters and make their own ethical choices find themselves at odds with the conventional morality of the day. It's a very key point, this, that ethics and morals are not quite the same thing. You can see that from the etymologies of the two terms in question. The word ethics comes from ethos, ancient Greek meaning character, meaning what sort of person you are, whereas the word morals has a Latin root, cognate to the word mores, or customs, or practices. And so moralities are about uh, uh, um, thinking in a, in a community or a social group about uh, how to behave towards one another. Moralities change over time. The pendulum swings backwards and forwards. In more liberal times, more puritanical times. We've seen it again and again. Look back across the last three, four hundred years of just of English history, not let alone British history, and see the Puritanism of the early 17th century, the libertinism of the Restoration period, the, the relative liberality of views in the 18th century, and the Regency period, followed by Victorianism. Think about the 60s and, and uh, the great revolution there. I've still got the hairstyle. Now we're moving back, <laughs> we're moving back into a more Puritanical age. Turn the pages of the Times newspaper and what do you see? Page after page after page after page about aging DJs and what they got up to back in the 60s. And you notice that we're coming back into this more puritanical uh, um, time. I suppose uh, because things like uh, uh, gay marriage, for example, frighten people who are conservative with either a small or a big C about these moral matters, and there's a reaction, and so the pendulum goes backwards and forwards. But ethical reflection, thinking about the question of value, of what really matters, of the nature of the good, of how we should treat one another, and on what basis we do so, so often stands at a, um, a very sharp angle to conventional moralities. It's very, been very often the case that the most ethically reflective individuals have been persecuted by their contemporary society. If you want an example, think of Socrates, who put to death by his own society because he asked him to think. Think what would happen to anybody in one of our political parties who asked anybody to do some thinking, rather than just going into the right voting lobby. Well, th these, these are uh, examples, not just of the great difference between an ethical outlook that says you are responsible for making your life good and meaningful. It's not a one-size-fits-all answer where each of us, um, under, the, under the cosh in a way of, of having to make some sense of ourselves so that we can make some sense of our lives and our relationships. And you all remember that thing that has to be a refrain at the back of all our minds, what Bertrand Russell said on this, most people would rather die than think, and most people do, and that's the great tragedy of the world in a way, that people want other people to do their thinking for them. They want to take a frozen you know, package out of the freezer of ideas and tells them how it all began, what it all means, what they should do, what's going to happen to them later on or when they die. Most people want the answers served up in a simple, digestible form. They don't want to have to think for themselves. They find it difficult or even frightening. If they look at their assumptions, they may find that they, there are some really important things that they disagree with in conventional morality, let us say, and they don't want to disagree with it because they feel really unsettled by it. People are horrified when they look into the realities of the sorts of choices that people make in the lives they live, and they're, they're, they're frightened off by them. You know, the great, the great premise of the moralizer is this. I don't like it, so you mustn't do it. I don't like it, so you're not allowed to see it. I don't like it, so you can't read it. That is the great premise of the moralizer, wanting to close things down for other people because he or she is very timid. Some of you in this room will remember Mary Whitehouse, the only human being in the history of the universe who had a television set without an off button. So she watched absolutely everything, all the nudity and sex after nine o'clock, and then wrote complaining letters about it. Why? Because she didn't like it. What was the consequence of her not liking it? Nobody else must be allowed to see it. Well, I mean, that is a kind of horror, if you think about it, the attempt to uh, interfere with other people's lives and choices in so dramatic a way. And when you look at the place of the law in matters of private morality, when you look at the attempt to organize society 
uh, and its institutions and its legal framework in, so, so as to corral and to lead people in certain directions, preventing them from making certain sorts of choices, uh, protecting certain um, people from the consequences of other people's choices. Then you see what it was that uh, Isaiah Berlin was so worried about, because I know the other thing you were reading in the bath last night was his two concepts of liberty. And so you'll remember he was, he was very anxious about the idea of what he called positive liberty, which is our, our governments telling us what's good for us and how we should live. And of course that, in the end, ends up with trampling on human possibility, because the variety, the responsibility, the diversity tends to get narrowed. And when it gets narrowed, it doesn't disappear, it goes underground. And when things go underground, they're much worse of a problem than they were when they were out in the open air. And that is what happens in puritanical periods of history when the government does our ethical reflection for us and gives us our morality. Now, humanism says we've each of us got to do our ethical reflection. We've each of us got to make our moral choices. We're each of us responsible for this life of ours, which uh, lies so briefly between birth and death, and so constrained by adventitious factors like the time we are born in, the period of history, the place, the geography, the society. And so navigating our way through this labyrinth of, of uh, constraints is a, a very important duty. Humanism offers a, a fantastic way of doing this. It offers us resources. The people you read when you're a humanist, the philosophers, the best of them, they don't say what you should think. They help you in learning how to think about things. They help you with insights and perspectives. They don't expect you to agree with everything, but they do expect you to make up your own mind at some point and to live accordingly with a certain kind of integrity or authenticity. It's not so fashionable these days uh, to um, invoke the spirits of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus, who, by the way, didn't really like one another and didn't quite agree about matters existential, but that's par for the course with philosophers. The a collective term for which, for whom, might be a disputation of philosophers or a disagreement of philosophers or a quarrel of philosophers or an argument of philosophers. So you can't expect any two of them to be so much in agreement with one another. But what they did agree about these uh, um, great figures of the existentialist movement was that we cannot expect to find meaning provided for us antecedently. They talked in rather dramatic terms about being thrown into the world, finding ourselves there in an absurd situation, absurd in the sense that it is uh, neutral as to matters of value and meaning. And that we have the responsibility, and Sartre in particular at times in his writing characterized it as a very awful responsibility because we have this deep metaphysical freedom where we can choose what we're to do, but the responsibility to infuse our life with meaning. And they talked about love, about freedom, about creativity, and about respect for human dignity as the four values that if we explored them and thought about what they really might mean and how we might try to realize them in our own lives would make our lives meaningful. And this is a, a very important point. There too, the assumption they're making is that we can uh, um, make each of us our own individual lives full of meaning, full of significance, and therefore, really worth living. Uh, and that assumption shares with the Socratic outlook the view that there isn't a one-size-fits-all answer to how we, how we should live. Cab drivers sometimes ask me what I do, and they always mishear my answer because I say I teach philosophy. To say that you are a philosopher is quite a big claim, isn't it, really, when you think that Aristotle and Immanuel Kant was, were philosophers. Put yourself in the same team as them like so playing for Manchester United or something. Um, so I say I teach philosophy, so they think that I am one. So then there's a silence, because they're obviously thinking to themselves, what the hell does a philosopher do when he gets up in the morning? We know what a plumber or a doctor does, but does a philosopher do this? <laughs> the answer is yes, by the way. And then, <clears throat> so then they, they almost always say, all right, governor, what's the meaning of life? And I say, I know the answer to that question. I wait a minute or two, because I can see the eyes in the mirror, you know, cab driver's eyes. Well, go on then, they say, what is it? And I say, it's what you make it. The meaning of your life is what you make it. It's a very, very simple answer, and it's a very deep one. 
It's an answer that Socrates gave right the way through the educated reflection on this matter of how we're to live. That is the answer that has come up again and again. And it's a heavy responsibility. What it demands of us is that we equip ourselves with the resources to think for the answer that is tailored to our own case. Well, do you know that um, the conversation that begins uh, the dinner of the seven wise men by Plutarch? Of course you do. You were reading it in the past. So you remember in that essay, it's a wonderful essay, that the, uh, two of the sages are on their way to this dinner party. And what, what is it? The dinner, the dinner of the seven wise men. It's always men in those ancient times, isn't it? I think it's because the ladies are doing something much more important and interesting. Anyway, so the two of them are on their way to the dinner party. The one says to the other, uh, we know what a host must do at a dinner party. He's got to provide the food, the wine, the entertainment. But what is the duty of a guest? And the other one said, a guest's duty is to be a good conversationalist. That is, somebody who is informed, knowledgeable, thoughtful, has got a point of view to put, to articulate it, explain and defend it if necessary, but also who is a good listener, who hears what other people say. <clears throat> you know, don't you, that most of the world's problems come from not hearing what other people say, but only thinking you heard what they said. <clears throat> Domestic infelicity turns on this very essential point. Well. You're really hearing what people say, as we say in our common idiom now, <clears throat> knowing where people are coming from, you know, really hearing them, and then being able to engage with them, draw them out, discuss, debate, challenge them if necessary. So to be informed and to be attentive, those are the two great things that make one a good conversationalist and therefore a good guest at a dinner party. But they are also precisely what makes one a good guest at the dinner of life. And that is what humanism asks us to be. Be a good guest at the dinner of life. Be informed, read, be a good conversationist, discuss, debate, listen to what other people have to say. Have a kind of intellectual integrity. Even if people think you are the most frightfully immoral person they've ever heard of because your ethical choices are not conformable to contemporary conventional ideas, nevertheless have the integrity and the honesty to uh, think through your values and to stick by them and to live them honestly. I'm a vegetarian. I'm going to end on this note, by the way. But I'm not a proselytizer. I don't want you all to become vegetarians. <clears throat> but I wear leather shoes. People say to me, that's inconsistent. I say, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and then, when their eyebrows have, have re reappeared from their hairlines again, I say, look, the thing is that um, I'm, I'm doing my best. Now, that claim that one is doing one's best is a terrible fig leaf. You can really get away, quite literally, sometimes with murder. You, know, you murder somebody and say, whoa, you did a terrible thing. You say, well, I was doing my moral best. It just kind of happened. And uh, <laughs> that, that, that would be a, a, no kind of explanation or defense at all. But the idea of doing one's best, the idea of, of an authentic endeavor to live a life which is consistent with one's principles, if it is sincerely meant, if it is genuinely meant, then of course it's a, an important and powerful thing. So when I'm really challenged over my leather shoes, I say, this poor cow is dead. I don't have to keep on killing a cow a couple of times a week to wear these shoes. So I can, I've got some sort of slightly sophistical justification for it, and I'm aware of that fact, and I have the grace to blush. But if you've tried wearing cardboard shoes in our climate, you can see the point. <laughs> so humanism, if one knows about it, if one sees it as an attitude, if one sees it as a very generous and thoughtful attitude that requires intelligence, remember what uh, T.S. Eliot said, there's only one method and that is to be intelligent. Remember one intelligent reader, reflective debater, discusser, an attentive listener, if one informs one's choices about how to live in this sincere way, if it's a sincere, authentic outlook, then one has an opportunity to make something of one's own life that might be uh, an inspiration and a help to others who want to make their lives for themselves. It moves away from this idea that there is an overarching agency that makes a demand of us and we have to conform, to obey, to submit. A tremendously different uh, premise for the moral life, the ethical life, uh, between the religious and the humanistic outlooks. 
So we are not in the metaphysical debate over theism and atheism, going to change the minds of the committed uh, theists. In the secularism debate about the place of the religious voice in the public square, I think we are making great progress. The uh, uh, British Humanist uh, Association and the National Secular Society and all of us here are uh, little by little, I hope, pushing the cart in the right direction, even though it does slip down the hill sometimes. Um, but the, the, the real issue is the undecideds, the people who haven't, don't know which way they're going to vote yet, who, who are hungry for an understanding of some framework of thought, some set of concepts or ideas, some approach to life that would help them to live it flourishingly and well. And what we need to do is to say, here it is, it's humanism. Humanism is an attitude, an outlook but it is a wonderfully resourced one. There's an enormous amount you can read and think about and it will make a great difference to your life if you were to adopt this approach to the question of the good. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Questions, comments or complaints? Now, not everybody might have heard that question. I just reprised the central point to it, which is uh, that, in effect, talking about the individual responsibility to make choices about how we live, uh, doesn't, isn't it sometimes the case that we need a, a, a communal agreement or a democratic agreement where, for example, in connection with uh, climate change, we have to act together, and that does mean subordinating the individual to the collective. Um, uh, great philosophical answer coming up. Yes and no. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, do, I think you're right that uh, signing up, I mean, volunteering for uh, the, the democratic process on matters like this, where we have to, we, we have to uh, temporize our own individual desires, for example, to consume a great deal and to keep our houses at 30 degrees centigrade and so on. Um, uh, you know, we have to temporize with, with those in the larger interest of the community. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's integral to what I was saying about the idea that good lives have good relationships at the heart of them, that um, to give and to receive love, to have friends, to be part of a community, to take one's part in the wider uh, society, to use one's vote, to think carefully about political process. All these things are part of the story. And that part of the story means that we're going to have to accept that sometimes our personal choices uh, have to be uh, constrained in the interests of the community. So I agree with you there. Anything which takes major collective endeavor is going to ask of us as individuals that we agree and go along and sign up. The, the other point that Mill made in On Liberty was that there have to be protections for minorities. I mean, if um, you know, there was a 51% vote that we don't like uh, you know, people with long hair, then we want to be able to protect the people with long hair from the, the sheep shearing scissors that the majority might want to wield. And uh, that, that kind of consideration is important too. So uh, a social structure, a political structure, has to be a complex one with lots of checks and balances in it, but where major important collective decisions, such as the one that you mentioned, can be enacted. So I agree with you there. But it doesn't seem to me to be inconsistent. It seems to me to be possible to make the case for saying that actually, whereas individual liberty and choice is crucial to the possibility of good individual lives, uh, there is a, a, a kind of enlightened view that individuals can and should take, uh, which is c relative to the, to the um, joint interest of the community. Yeah, yes, at the back on the left. Or on the right, depending which uh, perspective you come from. <laughs> Thank you. Um, earlier you said uh, that you, you found it a violation of the human rights of children to uh, bring them to a creationist museum. Later on you said that the moralizer always knows what others can't see. So, uh, uh, well, if you're talking about contradictions, does one of the contradictions I've been coming across and that you know, religious people have discussed with me that um, how can we on the one hand, you know, advocate what is right and what is probably right from a humanist point of view without um, falling prey to the hypocrisy of 
many religious people mm -hmm. um, who would make the same claims about us. Sure. We would say that going to an evolutionist museum is basically child abuse. Yeah, sure. Um, well, you put your finger on a really important point here. Or to quote a former pupil of mine at Oxford, you put your foot on something very important here, which is probably what one of the great issues that we've got to debate and, and come up with a decision on. Because let me just say that I do think it's a human rights issue that small children are indoctrinated into religious beliefs in such a way that it makes it can be very difficult for them to leave that religion or not be uh, shaped and framed by that early experience, even if they do cease to be religious. You know how it is? People who are brought up as Roman Catholics and become atheists are still Catholic atheists, and it's very, very hard not to be. And uh, Roman Catholicism and Islam are two examples of uh, extremely totalizing religious experiences for young people, and it's very hard for them to escape it. So it does seem to me to be a human rights issue. But then on the other hand, as you say, who are we, humanists and atheists and so on, to impose our view on everybody and tell them they're not allowed to believe in God? Well, of course the, the answer is, people must be free to believe anything they like, however silly. And uh, the, the constraint on them is that they shouldn't use that as an excuse for doing harm to others, which I'm afraid uh, you know, happens all too often. We're all very familiar with the saying, it takes religion to make good people do bad things, and I'm afraid that's too, too, too often true. So, what I would say about the Creation Museum is that anybody who goes to it should, either just before or just afterwards, um, you know, have a, have a session with uh, Richard Dawkins or uh, some evolutionary biologist. Hear the other side of the story. The point about these kids is they're not being given the other side of the story. What they're being told is that there are bad people out there who don't think that the deity did it all and that uh, they, they mustn't have anything to do with those people and they must shut their ears to them. And uh, you know the perpetual struggle that the United States has with itself over school curricula, especially in the Bible Belt states, is an example of how the, the, the war over this matter is waged. And it hasn't been won by, the, um, by, the, by either side. Although I think the um, uh, biologists have probably got the upper hand in most appeal court cases anyway. But I agree with you that um, shutting people up uh, is, is no great idea. People say to me, they look at my college, for example, and they see that uh, Richard Dawkins and Dan Dennett and Stephen Pinker and I and so on, people lecture there, they're visiting professors at the college. So they say, well, yours is an atheistical college, isn't it? I say, a higher education institution exists to teach people how to think, not what to think, so we don't spend any time proselytizing there. So they say, oh, in that case, you're gonna have a department of theology. I say, yeah, yeah, after we've got our department of astrology. Yeah, down in the front. Could you wait for the microphone, then everybody can hear you. Awesome, people can hear my voice <laughs> everywhere. Um, uh, yeah, uh, continuing on the question that he asked, would you say that it is outright uh, an immoral act to take children to this museum, or do you, would you say that it is some, something that cannot be judged to be immoral, because from their point of view, they're only doing the right thing? Uh, I believe it was Penn Gillette who at one point said when he came to proselytizing from people who were Christian that uh, he made the similitude of say you're a person standing in the middle of the road and someone else standing by the sidewalk thinks that there's a car approaching you. Even if this man is perfectly delusional and there is no car approaching you, it is still the morally appropriate thing for him to jump out and try to get you out of the way, away from this delusional car fantasy of his. So wouldn't you say that, in a certain sense, these people who try to indoctrinate their children are only doing the moral thing, trying to prevent their children from coming to hell? Well, well let, let me go back to the very first uh, part of the question that you asked there about, is it immoral for these children to be taken to the Creation Museum? Um, I think it is because it wouldn't be if they were told about all the creation myths and they knew about evolutionary biology, and they were in a position to evaluate the evidence and look at the reasons, and were left to make up the decision for themselves. Some of them might uh, you know, end up going with the, uh, the Mayan creation myth or the Zoroastrianism, or you know, if there were museums of, of creation from all the great religious faiths, 
and also uh, um, a thorough explanation of what uh, the evidence is for um, uh, descent with modification in the biological sphere. And if we were helping um, our students at school and university to be very good at evaluating information. I mean, look, you know, this is a, it's always been a crucial matter, the matter of having a good, sharp, critical awareness of arguments, of evidence, of how things stack up, of uh, just what a claim is that's being made and how you can test it. Um, but it's all the more so now that people can, at the touch of a button, at the speed of light, get all sorts of information and misinformation on the internet. And the internet is the, the biggest lavatory wall in history on which everybody scribbles their graffiti and about 90% of what's on it is a load of rubbish. People are very surprised when they learn that the um, Israel page on Wikipedia is modified several times a second because so many people are trying to you know, massage what the information is on there, both pro and con. And people are even more horrified when they realize that the automatic system used by Google to watch your searches so they know how to target advertising at you doesn't only target advertising, but because it knows your interests, when you ask it a question, it targets the kind of information to you that it thinks you might, be, might find agreeable. So you don't get a you know, a neutral, random set of information. You get information which is conformable to your view. That's frightfully worrying, isn't it? So to be a to be very good evaluator of information and sources of information, to be able to go into the Creation Museum and ask yourself the question whether you know, there are good biological reasons for thinking that Methuselah might have got to 900 years or that Tyrannosaurus Rex was ever a vegetarian with dentition like that and so on is important. So it's immoral if that is the only version that they're given and the alternative is demonized. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody. Take care.